Good morning, church. Hey, welcome to worship today. I'm Pastor Brett Herzog Bedkowski, pastor of this parish, this Trinity Lutheran Church in Centerbrook, Connecticut. And welcome to this Sunday's worship service. You're going to notice a couple of changes. One, it's long. Today's service goes over an hour, but it's worth it. Stick through. You're going to hear a great conversation with someone who, um, well, you need to hear the sermon today. And uh, it's a conversation with my friend Zahir Mainan um, from the Baitul Aman House of Peace Mosque in Meriden. He's the outreach director from the Ahmadiyya Muslim community here in Connecticut. And, uh, and he's a good friend of mine. And uh, we're going to be talking about Jesus. The other thing you need to know is a few announcements for the church. This might be the last pre-recorded service we have in a while because we are opening up for in-person worship next week, March 14th. So after worship, you will be getting an email sometime very soon with a link to reserve seats. Now you'll notice that Essex has been fluttering in and out of the red zone. And uh, technically we should be closed per the reopening plan that council approved in the fall, but we've been discussing over the last few days and decided in consultation with some medical folks that it's act that we feel comfortable enough opening up um, given some um, just some changes um, between now and the, and the fall in the past when we created the opening plan so we are going to open our plan is to be opening open for Holy Week it doesn't mean we'll be open for good we'll be keeping an eye on the infection rate if there's a surge we'll be closing again but for now our plan is to open up so what we need from you is volunteers. We need them. Please email Linda Rice and get signed up. We don't have enough people signed up to go every single week, two services um, with cleaning in between the church. All the same safety procedures we had before are still in place. So please sign up, we need your help. If you wanna be in person, and I know you do, and so do I, um, sign up. The other thing is, we'll still be online every single Sunday, eight and 10 o'clock, we'll be streaming live. So if you're not coming to church, you're not ready, you can't get a ride, you're vacationing once COVID is done in Honolulu or whatever, you can still stream, um, uh, watch the stream from our YouTube page or Facebook page. That's what I have for announcements today. God bless you. Stick through this service, it's a good one. And let us worship God Almighty.
When I'm weak, you are mighty. You are everything I need. You give me everything. You give me everything. You give me so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned but those who do not believe in him are condemned already because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment that the light has come into the world and people love the darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate and light and do not come to the light for that their deeds may not be exposed. But for those who who do what is true come to the light so that they may be clearly seen that their deeds have have done have been done in God. All right, Pastor Ken. Yes. Hey, sir. how you doing? Hey. Hey, listen. Um, you know John three sixteen? Yes, sir. Can you quote it? Or the, the, summarize it, whatever you want to uh, go ahead. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that those who believe in him will have eternal life. Okay. Do you know John three seventeen? No. Thank you very much. All right, uh, Pastor Justin. Hey, uh, you yeah. know uh, John three sixteen. I do. Can you quote it or uh, summarize uh, it or whatever? God so loved the world that He gave His only Son that whoever should believe in Him would not perish but would have eternal life. Okay, that, that the one you needed. Yeah. Can you? Uh, do you know John three seventeen? Uh, so that uh, He should have, have eternal life. I should because I know I need to read this in a week. <laughs> Can you quote it? If you give me another five minutes and I'm not put on the spot nervously trying to come up with it, maybe <laughs> I could come up with it, but obviously not immediately. Okay. That's it. That's all I want to know. Thanks. All right, bud. <laughs> See ya. Bye. Hey. hey. Pastor Joy, how are you? Good. Hey, uh, okay, do you know John 3.16? I do. Can you quote it or surmise it or, or what's the, that's not the word surmise. What's, can you quote it or, you know, generalize it? For God so loved the earth. For God so loved the world that God sent God's only begotten Son so that we would not perish but have eternal life. Yeah. Do you know John 3.17? Do you know John 3.17? Can you quote it? Oh, man. You know, Jesus talks a lot in the Gospel of John. He's, like, really, really chatty. He says a lot of things. Is that a no? No, I don't think I can quote it. Okay, off, thanks. Uh, off the top of my head. Bye, Joy. <laughs> uh, hey, Bible study. Trinity Lutheran Church Bible study. Hey, uh, do you guys know uh, John 3.16? Does it, Can anyone quote it for me? Sure. Go ahead. Yep. Yes. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, so that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Thank you. Um, does anyone know John 3.17? Hmm. Don't look it up. No, no, no. no. no don't look it up. <laughs> yeah. Uh, trick question. I know, I know I should. It's okay. Okay, that's all I wanted to know. Thank you very much. I hey, love you all. I love you guys. Oh, yeah, you're definitely in my sir. You're definitely in worship this week. Thank you. <laughs> do you know, do you know three seventeen? I, I, I yeah, this whole sermon. Okay, everybody, right wave now. bye, wave bye. I'm gonna look it up before. Yeah, okay. wave bye to the church. Bye. 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 Hey, bye. tell everyone join Bible study Friday nights at seven. <laughs>
If you asked me before preparing this service if I knew John 3.16, I'd have said yes. Most Christians know it. It's the Christian text. It's on bumper stickers and billboards, Hallmark cards. It summarizes God's love for us pretty well. And frankly, it's beautiful. But if you asked me what John 3.17 said, well, I, I couldn't tell you. Do you know? For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. See, here's the problem when we read any part of Scripture in isolation. We lose so much of God's heart, and God's heart is for the world. But one thing made clear by John 3.17, Jesus didn't come into the world to condemn it. That wasn't part of God's plan. Sometimes, however, Christians forget that. In our fervor to see faith in Jesus spread, we become judgmental. Thinking we are doing good, we in error do harm in Jesus' name violating God's intent in John 3.17. So I thought this week, why not have a conversation about Jesus and this salvation text with someone who's been on the receiving end of Christian judgment? A Muslim. So the sermon this week, a conversation with my friend, Zahir Menin, on the love of Jesus, John 3.16, in the taboo interfaith topic of salvation. All right, so uh, good morning, church. Um, so I am here with my friend, Zahir Maynan, who is uh, the is your official title Outreach Director? Yes. So Outreach Director at um, Baitulaman House of Peace Mosque in Meriden. You're part of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community. And um, we've known each other for like, I don't know, five years or so. And we've done a bunch of interface stuff. And uh, we've done symposiums. We've done stuff in the Tritown. We've done stuff over in down your way at, at the mosque. And... Um, and so, and often when we, when we get the opportunity to get together and talk about our, our religions and present on topics, we usually try and pick texts that give sort of a unifying message between religions. And there are a lot. <laughs> That's one thing we've come to learn. Um, and then this week, I, I don't have a lot of weeks left that I'm going to get to pre-record my sermon like this. And this, this week's sermon, um, and I sent this text to you, here, is um, the Christian, um, the Christian scripture that everybody knows, John three sixteen. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. And this is the text that. Is on every bumper sticker. I don't know if you've ever seen it. Like if you've ever seen the cars with the Jesus fish yeah. and sometimes in the middle is John 316 or J and 316. That's this verse. This is the verse that says, you could argue that would say like, if heaven is filled with just Christians, it's probably because of this verse or similar verses. It's also the verse that um, verses, sometimes this is called a hammer verse in, in that, it Christians can become um, very focused in their attention to evangelizing and um, and things like that. And evangel, in my opinion, evangelizing is good. People of all faiths do it, but it, but sometimes when you evangelize with a Bible in your hand and then you're whapping people, not so good, right? <laughs> and so this verse is one of the ones that sometimes. People use as the wrapping verse, the hammer verse, and 
Um, so you and I, we've done a lot of symposiums and um, we do verses that usually bring us together. But we thought what an interesting thing to do is if we did texts from your tradition and my tradition to talk today about hammer texts, about taboo, ta a taboo conversation about ways that we are not similar. Right. Is that kind of, does that, is that kind of how we are framing yes. our discussion? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like where, you know, because I'm the outreach director for my mosque and, and, and they chose me to propagate the message. Right. Um, so, so, you know, evangelizing is also part of our, um, that's your job, you know, man. It's your job. job. Yeah. And it's just, I'm, I'm just the one <laughs> it's that my directs. Job too. it's my job. Exactly. Too. Exactly. And, and, and we're not the only ones that do it. We're the ones that kind of direct it and steer it and guide it. So, right. you know, it's, it's something that we shouldn't be uh, shy of, and it's no. something that we could have an open conversation about that. You know, although we have unifying verses, we still maintain our identities. At some point you say, you are a Muslim. Yes. And I am a Christian. Yes. Right. We love each other. I love you. And I, I know you, you love me. I know you do. I feel that. Um, but I am a Christian. I There's a hundred percent of me. I'm filled up to the tippity top with my love of Jesus Christ and my beliefs. And I know I've, I've, I value, I value watching you and your beliefs. I know you are tippity top filled as an Ahmadiyya Muslim. I yes. watch it. So, but we never, we have never actually really talked about, we always, when we get together, we have this love fest about the ways that we share a unity in, in belief. Um, but we've never really spent a lot of time talking about these texts that are really different, that really make us and our religion different. And in some sense, depending on how you read them, uh, could be hammer texts against each other. Definitely. I definitely do agree with that. And, you know, like you mentioned before, you're filled to the top with the love of Jesus. Uh, so are Muslims. So am I. You know, Muslims do believe in Jesus, peace be upon him. And we have to say peace be upon him as an honorific to him mm -hmm. because he wasn't an ordinary person. Uh, but at the same time, we do believe that he was a servant of God, uh, created by God, just the way that Adam was created without mom or dad, but that Jesus was created without an earthly father. And he was the word of God that uh, God gave, Allah gave to Mary. And so, uh, you know, he had a fatherless birth in that sense. Um, and that, you know, he preached in the Quran that he was not the literal son of God. So that's where the difference is, uh, you know. Which is a pretty big, for, for Christians, it's a pretty big difference. So calling right. upon the name of Jesus as a Christian means calling upon essentially the name of God. In, in Jesus, we believe, right, being God incarnate, right? So, um, so when we look at the text today for the text that I brought to you is um, for God, so I don't have it in front of me, but for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, and we're talking about the son of God and essentially God himself incarnate. Um, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him as the son of God shall not perish, but have eternal life. So I guess my question for you is, um, my first question is, um, why don't you believe Jesus is the son of God? So the, so the question is that it's in the identity of Jesus, right? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, when someone knocks on my door and says, have you accepted Jesus? Um, you know, as your Lord and Savior. And I say, I have accepted Jesus as the Messiah, uh, but I haven't accepted him as my God. Um, because mm -hmm. one of the things from the Bible's own scripture or verses is that actually many have been called the Son of God. In fact, David in the Psalms, God said that um, today I have begotten you and says, and that's a revelation from God. When you read John in the beginning, those are not the words of Jesus. So, but the Psalms, uh, in, in contrast, are the actual word of God coming from God saying, I've begotten you as my son. So, and yet nobody worships David. Um, so that's just one example. My question, my follow-up question is, so you do uh, believe in Jesus. And then, and, and I, know, I just know this from our conversations before. And it's a different type of belief and it's a different type of reverence too. You do revere him. It's a different type of reverence. Mm -hmm. um, 
what 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 does the afterlife look like for you for you so and, and interesting question yes so i mean you know the, uh, the the holy quran says that you know if if anybody adopts a religion other than islam it will not be accepted of them so what does that mean so that's in english right so the arabic islam means peace and obedience to the will of God and surrendering your ego for God. And uh, it actually says this is the religion of Abraham. So the Quran says that there are verses which say that, you know, the Christians say be Christian, the Jews say be Jewish. Uh, but then God says in the Quran, but uh, we tell you to be Muslim, which is the religion of Abraham. Anybody can go to paradise. God says anybody can really go to paradise who believes and who does good works. So there really is no monopoly on salvation in Islam, but um, you know, we, it says to follow the religion of the prophets and to not associate God with God. You know, that, to say that there's any clay gods or any human beings that are gods. So the, the afterlife is God, God is merciful and he has the choice to accept or reject whoever he wants into paradise. But these are the teachings that we try to hold on to. So is that so is that i guess <laughs> so so what so what does that mean so spell it plainly for me we're having a taboo conversation is yeah, that sure. spell it plainly so so the quran says that god will ask jesus on judgment day that uh, did i did i tell you to tell the people to take me and my mother as gods and then jesus will say that uh, you know, holy art thou, I never said such a thing. So in fact, uh, you know, so the Quran says that uh, that one thing that God does not forgive is deliberate uh, worship of anybody other than God. You know, worshiping anything other than God is tantamount to idolatry in Islam. But not that, not, not, and the final thing is that not that God you know, God is the ultimate authority. He has the right to forgive whomsoever he pleases because he knows what's in your heart. But if, if you worship any, any deity other than God, that's where it's not, you know, in Islam acceptable. We, we agree with that. So you see a path, particularly for the Abrahamic traditions, you see that there's a path for salvation for Christians and particularly Christians and Jews. Um, and others. And others. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I, you know, there's so much that I know about your faith from you and from, you know, the other pastors and reverends yeah, yeah, and yeah. just from reading the, but I mean, it, it's kind of hard for me to ask you a question in that sense. And I kind of feel bad about it. Well, you that. should ask me. That's what, this is a give and take, man. Right, this right. Okay. Take. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, what, what is your, so, so when, when I say that the Bible is replete with the title son of God and it wasn't, in the original language was in, uh, you know, Hebrew or Aramaic. What is your response to that? Does, you know, how do you, how do you reconcile David being the son of God, but not being God incarnate? Yeah, I no, I agree with you. Son of God is used a bunch of times and son of man is, is also another term that's used because there's a lot of other passages besides son of God. Um, there's whole stories about, uh, the whole birth narrative. I mean, the son of God title is just one title among lots of titles that Jesus uses in the scriptures to, to ordain himself authority. And, and we see in the story if the, it's called the story of the transfiguration where Jesus goes up on the mountain and, and God literally says to Jesus, you are my son <laughs> from God's own voice from the heavens. <laughs> and, and Jesus is standing there next to Moses and Elijah who of course are dead they're not they're not alive but there's somehow manifested right next to him to, to show the authority and power of Jesus um, in line with the prophets and the law and, and God says hey, you you are my son my beloved and then he tells all the disciples around him listen listen to him but then Jesus himself in the scriptures tells tells the disciples about what it means to be a messiah what it means to be the son of God and, and, and the birth story itself from the angels. Uh, and then Mary herself pronouncing in the magnificent. So it's not, it's not just the title, the son of God, like 
um, I can wear the title pastor. And then if I never have a church, well, I, or I've never preached the gospel, if I never work on forming disciples, I'd be, a, it's just a title. It wouldn't matter anything, but there's a lot, hopefully behind the title that I'm doing behind the scenes that makes me people realize you could get rid of the title title son of god it could never be in the scripture and we would still know jesus is the son of god like as a christian reading the scripture i would say oh he's still the son of god without ever seeing the title son of god without without it ever being there you know what i mean so for me that's but you're right son of god does show up in other places um and it's sort of um it's i to me i see it also similarly that you to the way you see it as scripture informing scripture where um a lot of the christian scripture is informed by its jewish heritage it it, it's not it doesn't just come out of thin air (laughs) you know even the title lord is not you know we call jesus lord well it's a common title back then exactly why does he go by lord well it's not a unique title you know they called they called caesar lord you know, so is, is is Caesar on par with with Jesus Christ or with with any? Of course not. But they're they're using what they know, and so for for the Christian scriptures to take this title, Son of God, and to real for then it's almost like a like you think David's the Son of God. Well, here, G- Jesus, who is from David, here. Now here we are, the the descendant of David, King David, one of the most important people in scriptures, uh, who the prophets have ordained, and now we have Jesus who is ordained. So you know it's so that's where the you know and and this is the um, crux of it is that for for Muslims uh, for for you know as a Muslim I would say that when Jesus taught his his prayer that he said pray like this or pray yeah. like me. Yes. And then he taught the Lord's Prayer. Yeah. He didn't instruct anyone to pray to him. Uh, and he didn't instruct anyone to pray to Mary. Whereas, you know, there are sometimes crosses worn. And, and we consider that to be a form of uh, idolatry because it says <laughs> you shall have no image of the Lord. Yeah. But yeah. but it's, what's interesting is that Muslims do believe Jesus to be also. So we're talking about titles, right? Um, you know, uh, you know, does that entitle him to be worshipped and did he want to be worshipped because you know we see that you know he was in the garden of Gethsemane and the night before he was crucified and he was upset at his disciples that they weren't awake praying with him to to have him saved from being crucified in the words of take this cup away from me and you know but then but then the next that's verse that's not why he was upset with them though but go ahead that's uh, well, uh, okay, that, that's the way that I understood it. I could be wrong yeah, about yeah, it, that, sure. that, yeah. that he was upset that they couldn't stay awake praying with him. At least that's, that's, uh, that's you know, it. Uh, right. That's a safe though. Peter does okay. try and he cuts off a guy's ear and then Pete and, and Jesus says, don't, don't, don't try to stop this. And then he heals the soldier's ear and, and forces Peter to stay aside while he gets arrested. Right. Right. So, you know, so, so there's many, I mean, you know, we can get into a whole abyss because the whole thing is that w- did, did he teach his people to worship him? And did he tell, uh, you know, did he explicitly say that uh, I am God incarnate to be worshipped? Or did he, you know, show an example that he worshipped God and not himself? Mm. So, you know, because Muslims believe that he was at one with God that he had, you know, you talk about fusion and things like that. You know, every prophet was fused with the Holy spirit and with God because they, they were God on earth. We Muslims believe every prophet that came, it says in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 33, that the Lord came from Sinai. So the Lord came to, uh, from Sinai. That was the manifestation uh, in, in Moses, not just of the 10 commandments and of God revealing himself on the Mount, but Moses, whole life, the prophets are God's representatives on earth, but they are not to be worshiped. And, and that's where the question comes in that w- w- where's the interpretation to have him worship from Jesus's own words. So what do you take with stories like where, where, 
where Jesus gathers is with his disciples and he says, so who, who are people say I am? And they say, well, some say you're a prophet and some say, well, at one point they say, well, you're a prophet and you're a holy man. And, and he says, get behind me, Satan. Essentially saying, I'm not those things. And then later, another story says, well, who's people say I am? And they say, well, some say you're a prophet, some say, and then, and then he says to Peter, well, who do you say I am? And he says, you're the Messiah, you're the son of God. And then he says, on you, I will build my, my church. You know, he gives him the name Cephas, the, the, the rock on you, I will build my church. Whatever uh, you loose on earth will be loose in heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. What, what do you take, what do you make of, what do you make of that? So, so the, so the whole idea. Uh, you, by the way, I'm not, I'm not throwing scriptures. Like this is, no, 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 I like this. Not a, I like not, this. this is not a gotcha conversation. I refuse no, to have gotcha no. conversations with anybody. I'm curious about if you've heard yeah. that story and what do you make of it? Right, right. And you know, that's the premise that we set out. I, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm yeah. digesting these things and, uh, and just yeah. responding. And I, and I, and I like this on, uh, on this conversation. I'll send it to you. I'll send you the passages we talked about too. I'm going to make a note about what we talked about. Please do, please do. You know, so, so the response to that is, you know, you know, you have to go back to the original words that Jesus said. So when they, when they called him Messiah, what did that mean? So does, do you interpret Messiah to mean son of God? Because Jesus is not the only Messiah in the Bible. In the book of Isaiah, chapter 45, verse 1, King Cyrus the Great, a Gentile, is called Messiah in Hebrew, the Messiah, the anointed one. So Messiah and Messiah in, in Hebrew and Arabic both means right. anointed. We believe that God, uh, you know, sent down the Quran because other scriptures had become corrupted just to be just to speak you know to you honestly uh, of, you know why did the quran need to be revealed and you know why don't i believe jesus to be the son of god and it's because god corrected that belief through prophet muhammad peace be upon him in the original language and it, that language is preserved today i i can't say the same about the bible so i so 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 it's a counter question that what title or what words are used as the son of God? Is it literal? Is it allegorical? Is it symbolic? Because I, I'm failing to see in the gospels, and I'm just speaking as a, as a, you know, somebody that's learning or wants to learn. I'm, yeah. I'm failing to see the, the quote where Jesus instructs people to worship him after he's gone or even while he's alive. I, I guess, I, I guess, I'm hearing what you're saying about the Messiah thing and that I suppose, I suppose if you aren't somebody who sort of reads this, the scripture and from the beginning to the end and, and is like, Oh, I see what Jesus is doing. <laughs> like, okay. I see what he's doing. He's, he's, clearly making his way to the cross so that he can make his way to heaven and sit at the throne of God. Like this is a, this is a narrative here. And this is a progression. Then you can sort of sit and, and, and I guess the stuff about the word about the Messiah and, and it is true, but the, the Cyrus thing is the only other person in scripture called Messiah. Um, but for us, for us, he, there's not even a, it's not even a question about whether Jesus wants to be worshiped or he, right. He builds the church. He starts, he starts the church on Peter and, um, uh, and, and the Messiahship is, it's sort of everything. I mean, it, it is the whole narrative of the gospel from the very beginning to the very end for who he will become at the end that you're supposed to actually it's, I guess it's interesting hearing this from a, from a person who's not a Christian. I've never actually heard that before because it's sort of, I take it for granted. Like, of course everyone reads this and it's like, yeah, he's even if you don't believe it, like if you're an atheist, I've had this conversation with an atheist, even if you don't believe it, you sort of read it and you're like, okay, he's, god incarnate he's going to the cross he's gonna die like i don't believe it but that's what he's doing but you read it and you distrust it like distrust that that's what jesus is intending or saying about himself 
So it's it's not distrust. It's it's more of you know seeing it in the light. I mean, you know, my response would be that if if you read the um, you know the Torah, the Pentateuch, that all the way down to Malachi before the New mm -hmm. Testament, um, mm -hmm. it, it it keeps painting the same picture that God is one. You know, you know, Isaiah says the same thing that he is without a soul. She, you know, you know that. But but he calls his loved ones his sons. He calls it. Mm -hmm. And and then the other question would be, you know, it's Women's History Month, right? You know, why doesn't God have a daughter? You know, it, it, what is the defect in women that God doesn't have a daughter? Mm -hmm. uh, literally speaking, if Jesus is the son of God, how come God doesn't feel adequate having a daughter or calling anybody his daughter and it, and it fits in line with the old testament of god using that term son of god not necessarily for males only but for whole nations mm -hmm. because it's beloved of god not that in you know in fact when when moses you know frees the israelites or god frees them through moses uh, the first thing they do is build a golden calf the first thing they do is create an idol of god mm -hmm. and and you know, and that's where God's anger makes them wander for 40 years to purify mm -hmm. that, that, that generation. So the whole idea comes that, you know, God is much against idol worship or calling anybody equal to God. And then suddenly in the New Testament, you, you have this very romanticized kind of, in my image, and, and by no means do I mean disrespect, and I'm not trying no, to, I, you, know, can, uh, you know, be, yeah, be little you. In this conversation... It's a free flow. There's no disrespect. Okay. I, so yeah. it's not the distrust. Um, it's more that the the Hebrew Bible painted a picture that it seems that the new that the that the New Testament also adheres to, and and that's the way that I see it. But but you know the the Romanized version of it is that Jesus, the Son of God, and that's where we see that the Roman you know idolatry kind of crept in because December twenty fifth is you know, neither the birthday of Jesus nor something he celebrated himself. The idea of Islam as a Muslim is that, you know, inventing something new that a prophet or a Messiah or, or a Christ didn't do is straying away from their path. So I know that in the Bible, Jesus did not celebrate Christmas or the 25th. In fact, he celebrated Passover. The, the, the last supper was Passover cedar, mm -hmm. you know? And so, so it, it, Jesus held on to the commandments and he said, I am not come to destroy them. And that's where I see that it's painting but a picture. He, he, he goes on. I've come and to fulfill them. Exactly. Exa yeah. So he didn't come to say that the, that the old, that, that the Testament is old that he came to say that I am the living testament, you know, that I am the, the fulfillment of that testament and that we believe in everything Christians believe in about Jesus. But, but the idea comes to that, you know, that it's, it's painting a picture of that Jesus is saying himself that, you know, or he doesn't say worship me, but uh, Paul and his writings and the Christians later on started to worship Jesus. Whereas we see or I see in the Gospels that the disciples didn't bow down to Jesus and call him God or that you are God incarnate. You know, you know, seeing that you you believe these things and I believe these things. And the whole thing comes down to that. Why worship Jesus? Why isn't it enough to worship God? the father of Jesus and to recognize and honor Jesus. And, you know, we pray for Jesus. We don't pray to him. Mm -hmm. So, you know, why, why deify Jesus, um, especially, you know, that he's not here anymore. <laughs> I mean, meaning not, not in a mocking way, but in a way that just like every other human being, he had a life and, and to us, God is beyond, uh, you know, is the ever living. He doesn't live or die. I mean, you know, can he's I, not born or dies. Uh, he lives forever. Can I really blow your mind here with, with, with something that we believe? We genuinely Please. believe. Christians believe you cannot know God except by knowing Jesus. Like that it's impossible. It's impossible to fully know who God is except through Jesus. Like if it weren't for Jesus, you would have no idea who God is. <laughs> I started I started this with a question about... Um, I forget how I asked it. I said, why don't you believe in Jesus? But, yeah. but really in one of the symposiums we were talking and when it, we, one of your 
people from your mosque had asked me, he said, well, if you believe all the, this things about it, about how the Sermon on the Mount shows up in this, in the, in the Torah, in the, in the Hebrew Bible and in the Christian scriptures and in, in the, in the Quran and, and we have a unified message around this teaching and it's so important and, and there's, is a progression in religion and all that stuff and um and the teachings are are really you bond us and stuff he goes and he said why aren't you a muslim and i said because i'm a because i'm a christian <laughs> because because i'm a christian because i'm um I'm, I'm filled to the tippity top with my love of jesus it's because not because a, a lot of the things in the quran are in the in the christian scriptures because muhammad's not in the in the scriptures and that's just the way it's just it, that's it and i said but i said but i i'm he I, I need to learn from you because i need you to be as passionate as you can i said when you're passionate i said i know you're being faithful when you're being faithful i know that you are loving and caring for people and i i i'm interested in you being so i didn't use the word but a zealot for your faith <laughs> because the more faithful you are the more the more the more people are helped. And the same thing for true. I, I, I came to these symposiums and I'm having this conversation with you because in one sense, um, and, and the direction I'm going with this, because I want to sort of get back to this text, John three sixteen, is we, we do believe you can't know God except through Jesus. I'm, I'm not a universalist. I don't know what heaven, I don't even pretend to even try to think about the afterlife. To me, it's not my place. I love how you, I love, I always get, I always glean so much from you when we talk um, and one from your spirituality and, and wisdom. And when you said like, um, I forget how you were about like sort of God, it's God's job or something. You sort of said like, it's God's, yeah. it's, it's up to God to figure out. And I believe that, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, yeah. So John three sixteen says, um, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. And, and we, beat each other to hell with that. Christians do beat, beat the world to hell with that. We go to people like you and we say, well, it, you know, you're going to hell. You don't believe in the son of God. I know you said you believe in Jesus here, but didn't you read John three sixteen? It's the son of God. He was baptized. Were you baptized here? It was the son of God. Right. And we do that. And then you say, well, no, but I love you. And I love God. I love Jesus. And we say, well, too bad. You didn't say you believed. You didn't accept Jesus in your heart. And, and so sorry hell for you and and but then but then john three seventeen, right next to it uh john three seventeen. And a lot of christians don't know it but it says in, indeed god did not send jesus into the world to condemn the world but in order that the world might be saved through him i don't know if that's the exact quote hang on do not send the son oh do not send the son into the world to condemn the world but in order that the world might be saved through him yeah that's the quote so um so for me religion is um, and I think why we do these is it becomes something it, fanaticism. It's funny. A lot of people hate fanaticism. I love fanaticism. I think it's great when you're a fanatic for the right reason, for the right things. Like when I see you, I'm like, Oh, so here's, he's a fanatic. He loves, he loves, he's so in love with God. He's so, in, you're such a dad. <laughs> you're such a good husband you know what i mean like you're a fanatic for your work um and and you're passionate about caring for your community you know what i mean and so yeah. for me so when i responded to the person at your church um it was like no like you should you should be a fanatic i didn't say this but like you should be a fanatical muslim <laughs> And I know like people are going to be like, he just, he wants to be a radical Muslim. No, I want, like you should be a devout. You should be devout. Yeah. Right. And, and if I'm so inspired that like after talking to that, I'm going to go home and I'm, I'm, I know you sent me a bunch of verses and if I read them and then all of a sudden I become a Muslim, maybe you'll celebrate. I don't know. I don't know what you do when people convert to and join your mosque. I have no idea. Um, do you throw a party? <laughs> I don't know. Do you guys throw a party? Well, no, you know, we just pray together, man. <laughs> okay. Well, that's great. Maybe you'll pray with me. Um, I don't think that'll happen, but maybe, you know, and, and I think that all people should become Christians. I think it's the best religion in the world. I think it's the truest religion in the world. And, but it's not my job. It's not, it is God's job. And all I can do is just be a fanatic Christian, but in love, 
in true love. And like, so, so you're not a Christian. We have disagreements. You're going on about the son of God thing. You're really harping about this, the language thing. And I don't, I get it. And I think you're kind of a little off on the thing, but, and now you're moving your camera, but whatever, I think you're a little off, but whatever. But you know what? If you, you live the town next over from me, I, sw I swear to you, if you ever call me up in the middle of the night, you said you needed something. I, or you need a place to stay. We would move your whole family in here. I I'm not even lying. You know what and I mean? I, and I feel the same way about you, my friend. I mean, yeah. you know, it's, it's, it's that symbiotic thing. I mean, we're, we're one in the same and we're just different identities. It's like, like what I say, it's like different shirts. I mean, you know, if, if, if I can indulge you real quick, you know, when Islam was first growing and the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said that God is only one, there was a Christian king in Abyssinia that allowed Muslims to stay in his country free of persecution because they were getting persecuted in Mecca. Just like you invited me to your house and said that if there's ever a need, I could come to your house. That actually happened. A Christian king allowed the weakest and earliest Muslims to stay in this country without persecution and bullying because they were persecuted by their own brothers and sisters and uncles in, in Mecca. So, you know, that's the idea. And, and the Quran says the same thing. The Quran tells me that, you know, that word jihad, that's such a taboo word, right. really based on scripture, it is to defend your right to be a Christian. It is to, to defend Rabbi Marcy's right to be a rabbi. I, if yeah. your church is ever under attack, my scripture tells me that I must go and defend your church. Even though you might worship Jesus, you might worship Mary, you might have an image of God or whatever, I, I still have to defend your church from being attacked. Even though in the Middle East, you might see, you know, Taliban or Al-Qaeda destroying temples and things like that, which is completely against Islam. So, you know, that's where the Quran says you will find Christians to be the closest in love to you. The, I, and I appreciate that. And... And so I guess my church is probably wondering, like, why in the heck is he interviewing a Muslim for today's sermon? And I think the point is because I am so sick and tired of fanatical Christians who are fanatical in the wrong way. Right. Who have spent their energy and emotions beating up people for their faith, thinking that that's going to shine the light on the love of Jesus and the love of God. And saying, well, well, God said he loved the world. He gave his son so that whoever believes in him may not perish. And we just people to perish. We don't want people like Zahir to perish in eternal in eternity. So we love him by pointing him to Jesus. Well, we had, I don't know, a 40 minute conversation about Jesus. I'm I'm more in love with Jesus. I know you're in love with Jesus. We shined a light on Jesus. And and I've grown. I have bonded more with you today. Definitely. I definitely I've feel learned more about you as a person. We've asked questions about each other after we hang up. I'm going to talk a little bit more about your kids. Cause I haven't you know, heard about them in a while, but, um, but more importantly is because we skip over the other verses in the scripture. I I'm talking to my parish now. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not talking to you. I mean, I am, but I'm talking to my parish because right after that, it says God didn't send Jesus to condemn the world. So why are we condemning the world? It's not on us to condemn anybody. It's on us to, to shine the love of God so we can do God's work. And that's it. And so I would be privileged to continue to do God's work with you. I know you're doing God's, God's work. You do blood drives. You raise a ton of money for, for a lot of nonprofits. You, you serve your community in beautiful ways that I admire. And I, I literally follow you guys so that I can get ideas for my church and how we can better serve our community. You know what I mean? Same here. So, Same here. So, so to me, judgment and righteousness and all that stuff, that is, that power does not belong to hu human beings. Amen. I think we agree with that. I think that's true for our religions, you know. Amen. Amen. And, and you said it beautifully. Don't be shy to be, um, to make your faith, your identity. And that's one of the things that the world yes. is losing is that we, we tend to melt our identity to whatever we think is, you know, right. a, you know, cool or trendy, but remember that those trends fade and die, but God's word and God's love never does. So, right. you know, the, the, the whole idea is that whatever we may believe about Jesus, we still 
believe in Jesus. And, and although, you know, uh, you know, we, we might have different viewpoints on him, it brings us to God. And it, and, it, and it brings us to the conversation of God. And that's why we're here. We can leave it up to God to judge. And we have our separate beliefs. And yet we help each other in righteousness. And sometimes more than other Muslims help me in, in righteousness. And I'm sure more than other Christians might help you in righteousness. Maybe sometimes I help you more in righteousness. So that's the whole idea here is that, you know, uh, coming together to help each other despite having the differences. Yeah. And then it- at the end of the day, we pray for each other and, I, and we might be praying different prayers and I, and we might be praying different things and, but, but we go to God for each other and what else can you do? <laughs> what else can you ask for beyond that? You know, so you pray for me and I pray for you and our families. And at the end of the day, um, I'm going to be there for you and I'm going to pray for you and I'm going to show up for you. And, and that's how we, that's how we have to live in the world. And it will make our community safer and stronger. And it will make us better Christians. And it will make your community better Muslims. It just will. I definitely agree with that. Yes, definitely. And that's something that the world needs more of honesty and, uh, you know, identity. And yet bridges, uh, you know, between different houses. Yeah, I love that. I really love that. that. That's, look at you. You could write a, that would be a great book title. So that would be, don't, I can't put this in the video because you're going to write a book and that's going to be the title of the book. Hey man, we could co-author that. We could co-author. So here, thank you. Um, I, I wish you blessings and I, I actually really do appreciate you. This is maybe my last recording um, doing a sermon like this for my church. And it, you have blessed my congregation by, by being here. So thank you very much. Well, thank you for the opportunity and the blessing. I'm blessed to be part of your sermon that was very humbling of me and uh you know let's let's keep doing this i i wish to have you at my mosque whenever our mosque opens and if people want to learn more about the Ahmadiyya muslim community where should they go to find information so they can go to www.muslimsforpeace.org okay so here god's blessings to you brother and peace uh, blessings to you and your community welcome okay. islam Shalom Aleinu, Od Yevo Shalom Aleinu, Ve'yar Kulam. Od Yevo Shalom Aleinu, Od Yevo Shalom Aleinu, Od Yevo Shalom Aleinu, Ve'yar Kulam. Salam, Aleinu Ve'yakom Onam. Salam, Salam, Salam. Salam, 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 God, let me not condemn others in this imperfect world. This world is but a shadow play of your world in heaven. As I looked for a better year and relief from isolation, I have been confronted with many challenges, family in need, losing my job, the death of my husband, and the need to still give support to others. Yet there is still love and joy in this world. Let me remember 
that I do not know the plight of others. They too deal with misfortunes, doubts, and questions. I do not know their path to salvation. Let me give them my right hand to steady them as they stumble, as Christ gives to me. This world filled with beauty and joy, pain and ugliness, is our veiled bridge to the realm of God. This world is the word and will of God, and his creation has been diminished by humanity. I know that I am imperfect and fallen, yet each day you forgive me and help me find the strength and faith to start again. Let me act with your potential for me with grace. Let me be, grant that grace to everyone I encounter during the day. I cannot know what their struggles and paths are on earth, so let me not judge them, but let me wish them Godspeed. The signs of God abound on earth. May my faith be like the bulbs I planted in the fall that seemed dormant during this long winter of our pandemic discontent. Yet here they are beneath the melting snow, ready to burst into bloom. God, may your will for each of us be done on earth as it is in heaven. All this I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Hello, church. I'm Warren Cleveland. I'm here in my temporary home office and want to talk to you about our church offerings. Over this past COVID year, we've had a lot of time to reflect about the importance of giving and of the first line responders who have given so much. That includes the nurses, the doctors, the dentists, grocery store clerks, teachers and school employees, the factory workers, and the list goes on. However, we can also reflect about how Trinity over the last few years has continued to raise the bar in giving to our community. There's the school backpack program, the soup kitchen, God's work at our hands projects, and the many projects supported by benevolence. Spring will be here before you know it, and with spring comes new growth and new opportunities for ourselves and for others. All can help Trinity grow in its continuing effort to help others in the community, either through financial donations, an offer of your time and talent, or at the very least, by each of us showing more kindness, patience, and goodwill as we move through the year ahead. To paraphrase what Jesus said about God's final judgment, it is what you do for the least of those among you that determines who we are as individuals and as followers of Christ. Thank you. Fine. I knew it. <laughs> I'm at the uh, I'm at the Lutheran Cemetery in Portland, and uh, I've been looking for a I've been looking for one of these gravestones to say uh, something about the cross of Jesus. It is a Lutheran cemetery, after all, and here it is. Here it is, beneath the cross of Jesus. I knew I'd find one. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. This is this is our belief. This is our this is our heart, the heart of our faith. That God did send his only son into the world. For us, for our salvation. Because he loves us. Because he cares about us to the ends of the earth, to death itself. That's what we believe. We know what happens after this, that when we die, that God clings to us, that Jesus went to the grave for us so that, when, so that in our final moments, when we close our eyes, we wake again in the realms of the angels to trumpets and choirs because of him. But the one thing we don't need in this world, church, the one thing we don't need is judgment. God's judgment we need. Judgmental Christians, we don't. Ego and self-righteousness. We need to lay that aside. It doesn't shine the light of Christ. It 
doesn't shine the light of our beliefs. What we need to be is fully in. We need to be fully committed to the love of God. Devout. Extreme. Faith, extremely faithful for the love of God. Can we do that? This Lent, we're following Jesus to the cross. Where he'll give everything he has to us for our salvation. Says, I'm going to give everything I have back to him. I'm going to be the most Christian Christian I can possibly be. I'm going to, I'm going to fill up to the tippity top with my love of Jesus. I'm going to be the most devout person I can, but I'm not going to hammer other people with it. I'm going to shine with it. And I'm going to let God do the rest. Will you do that with me, church? Will you love this world so hard that others will fall in love with Jesus? Well, that's it for us this week, church. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And may the Lord look upon you with favor and grant you peace. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Okay, but my angle's a little bit off, though. For you uh, or for me? No, for me. But I think it's what all right. You, what are you talking about? You look sharp. I can see all the white hairs perfectly clear. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Good. Perfect. <laughs> I wouldn't want it any other way. <laughs>